I decided to join the Army when I was about 10. I announced I was going to be a rock and roll nurse. I really wanted to be a part of something that was bigger than myself and, and doing good things in the world. I'm Captain Sarah Keller. I was born in Edmonton, Alberta, and I serve with the Health Services Branch of the Canadian Army. I grew up watching the TV show MASH. I'm actually a member of the Canadian version of the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And when I was really young, two of my relatives were in the reserve, so I heard about their stories. My mom wasn't very impressed. I think the first time that I mentioned joining the Army, uh, I don't think she really took it seriously. Uh, her exact words were probably over my dead body. She uh, raised her children to be strong and independent individuals. So I think when I turned up with the application paperwork for the military, she was horrified. Uh, she actually refused to sign the paperwork for me to join the regular force. I was underage, so I did need parental consent. She said she wouldn't sign my life away for five years, but she would agree to me joining the reserves because it was something that was uh, perceived as less commitment. But I turned around and took a full-time job with the reserves, so I won. And I think by the time I moved over to the regular force, she, um, she knew more about what our mission was, what our role was, and she was really proud, and still is. On the morning of 9-11, I came to work, and I was a member of one field ambulance here in Edmonton as a medical technician. I was just coming into the building, and we have a, a canteen with a TV, uh, usually tuned to the news, and I think someone yelled for us to come that there was something on the news. I think it's probably one of those moments that you're never going to really forget where you were, and it didn't really seem real. When there's a pivotal event like that, I think myself and my peers, you just think this is it. This is, this is when we're going to do everything that we've always trained for. We're going to have the opportunity to uh, do something on the world stage, to participate in that piece of something bigger than me and something that's doing a good thing in the world. And so there's the sense of urgency, but also the sense of excitement that you're going to be able to contribute positively, in a possibly in a major way. I was deployed with 3rd Battalion of Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry as a part of the Kandahar Provincial Reconstruction Team, or KPRT for short. We were really there to lay the groundwork uh, for counterinsurgency operations, but also to help the local people and the government rebuild their country. I was on a rotation zero, so the group that I went with was the first to go in that role, and it was really a fastball, so we didn't get as much training as future tours did. We had about five weeks and we learned about the country, um, the culture, the language, the people that we would be meeting, and we learned what sort of challenges we might face. It had been destroyed by decades of war. The Taliban had recently been removed from power and they needed to rebuild uh, infrastructure, provide security and um, really support rule of law with the new government. So brassards are worn by military personnel to indicate uh, a little bit about what their job is. So we wear it on our shoulder and it has the uh, crest of the Armed Forces of Canada and the Red Cross. So this indicates that I am a medic. I was a medical technician and I was tasked with an infantry section as their patrol medic. So when the infantry section goes out on a patrol, whenever medical aid was needed, I was the primary medic for them. So in the field, the primary injuries that we would treat 
uh, were related to blast injuries from improvised explosive devices. Enemy combatants will take uh, munitions that have been discarded by uh, you know, previous engagements, anything they can find, and construct a device that will explode either on um, command and generally designed to um, injure or kill um, anyone who comes in contact with it. The main thing that we needed to look for as we were driving uh, were signs of IEDs, and that could be um, signs of recent road work that wasn't planned or um, that we were tracking, so a pothole that had been filled. Anything to the side of the road, debris, garbage, even animal carcasses, they were known to pack with explosives and set with a detonation that they, as soon as your vehicle passed, um, they would you know, hit the trigger and the carcass of a donkey would explode. Basically anything that was trying too hard to look like it was supposed to be there. I actually brought uh, a piece, a fragmentation piece from one of the sites I was at. I think this is probably a part of an old Soviet uh, anti-personnel mine. And this was a piece of shrapnel that came off an explosive. Thankfully, we didn't have very many injuries on our tour. Um, the second major IED strike did involve uh, a Canadian diplomat who died, Mr. Glenberry, and three of our soldiers were very seriously injured. Um, it happened probably about half an hour after my patrol had done that exact same route. All the previous injuries had been relatively minor um, for our own troops. This was the first time that we had to treat our own soldiers with very, very serious injuries. And that's, that is what we train to do. We hope for the best, uh, but plan for the worst. Yeah. When we were out on patrol, it was often sleeping in uh, your sleeping bag underneath your vehicle, um, because that was a, the, the safest place once the ground was proved or um, proved means to be cleared of any um, mines or explosives. The dust there is like talcum powder. Um, as soon as you set your foot down uh, in Kandahar, the dust just kind of poofs up and gets everywhere. Um, and it's a country that has a lot of contrast. I remember uh, first going out into Kandahar city and everything sort of seems like the same color. It's this you know color of clay. And then there'll be bright spots of color in clothing or in, um, things that are for sale at the stalls and shops. These beautiful pieces are made by local children. We held a competition. It was, a, it was like an arts and craft competition. And the primary art in this area was beading and embroidery. So these pieces of jewelry um, and the embroidery on the scarf were made by young girls aged six to about 10 or 12. And at the end, we auctioned off all the items. And the winners were presented with sewing machines, which would be a huge um, benefit to their family because then they would be able to make their own clothes easier, um, perhaps uh, help with um, finances in the family by making and selling items. But the craftsmanship in these items is just mind-blowing for someone so young with limited resources. Uh, this was the winner, this piece here. It's just a little, a little beaded purse um, made by hand. And I think she was probably about nine. Often they don't know how, how old they are, so we're just sort of judging by, uh, by their growth um, milestones. But just beautiful work. And this one actually has the name of the girl that made it. Her name was Amina. And she would have been probably about eight or nine years old as well. Being in Afghanistan as a female and being on patrol was surprising for the local population. Um, most of the individuals that we came into contact with were male, simply because of the way their culture functions. So they always wanted to, um, to talk to me, to try and take pictures. Uh, sometimes they would want, I think, to touch um, my face or my weapon to see if I was actually real, if I was actually female. And once we were able to talk with them, we always had an interpreter with us, and they understood that, yes, I do the exact same job as all the other members of the section. They were actually pretty accepting. 
And we had the opportunity to work with the Afghan police and bringing in their first female section, um, along with our, our CNP members that were deployed with us. I think being in Afghanistan gave me a perspective on what poverty really is and what suffering really is. Um, there's no context that, for that in Canada. I primarily saw it in terms of the children of Afghanistan. They often couldn't go to school because the schools had been bombed or closed or the teachers had been uh, taken away, never to be seen again. So they had no means of education, which meant that they had to go to work. So when we would go on patrol uh, through some of the villages and, and cities, you know, children as young as five and six years old would be working. And that could be anything from picking up uh, shell debris from a field to sell for scrap and risking exposure to IEDs that were still in place or old ordnance that could explode to um, weaving or cleaning shops and it was heartbreaking as a Canadian to, to see that because it's so much different from how children are in Canada. I think that it gave me a, a new appreciation for how lucky we are and um, how other countries can use our support and, and benefit from the world, showing them a different way. My husband and I met when we were both in the military. And I think that we had an understanding We'd each joined the military before we met each other. So we understood that commitment in one another. My husband Bryce was deployed on Task Force 0106. He was in the infantry and their mission is to close with and destroy the enemy. They were there on a counterinsurgency mission to root out remaining Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters to bring greater security to the people of Afghanistan. He was supposed to come back on August the 11th of 2006. And when I was driving to work on the 3rd of August, I heard on the radio that a very good friend had been killed, uh, Corporal Chris Reed. We had served together in Yugoslavia a number of years before that. And he was my husband's driver in his light armored vehicle. I came into work and I wasn't doing well. I went straight to my chain of command and said, I need someone to find out where my husband is. And it turned out while I was driving to work that the notification team, so the people that come to tell you when a bad thing has happened, were on their way to my house and we passed on the highway. I found out that my husband wasn't in Chris's vehicle. If he was, he would be here today. He had been killed attempting to provide cover for an injured member of his section. And he didn't come home. Remembrance to me means taking some time to to consider how lucky we are as Canadians, uh, that freedom comes at a high cost, and that a lot of men and women have uh, served this country to keep it free and safe. When I announced at 10 that I wanted to be a rock and roll nurse uh, in the Army, I, I've achieved the Army part and I have achieved the nurse part, uh, still working on the rock and roll. I think when I first joined I was very idealistic and I saw myself going on UN missions and wearing a blue beret and in the end I've done a lot of peace support operations and I've done a lot here in Canada and that's what I'm most proud of. I have been deployed here in Canada for Opry Assurance, the ice storms in 1998. Um, I've done support to the fires in BC. Uh, security support to international conferences and I think despite some 
horrible things. Um, it's been a really good experience and there's not much that I would change.